One of the most powerful parables in the Bible is that of the Good Samaritan. A man is passing by seeing a stranger lying on the road, and the Bible is from the, on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, that many, many people have passed by and done nothing to help this, this suffering person. But the, the man from Samaria, the Good Samaritan, gets, gets down off his camel, helps the man, brings him to an inn, gives the innkeeper money, checks on him to see that he's, he's surviving and doing well. The idea is you should treat everyone as you would want them to treat you. It's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, it promotes the notion of social community, a sense in which a reciprocity, we all should help one another if we ever want others to help us. But that Good Samaritan rule often gets challenged because in many situations, people are, who are in need don't get the support they need. People pass them by and that's called the bystander effect, the bystander indifference. So again, while you're watching uh, this uh, film clip, keep thinking, would I help? Would I intervene? What are the forces in that situation that would make me help? Or what keeps me, like most people, from helping, from being passive, in some cases from being indifferent to the suffering of my fellows? watch a pickpocket in action. The woman with the rucksack is his victim, and the man in the grey top on the left is the thief. Except they're both acting. In fact, everyone in the queue is with us, apart from the man in the blue shirt. As the thief moves in, will our bystander notice? He clearly has. What's more, he's seen that other people in the queue have noticed too. Now, what's he going to do about it? The answer is nothing. After all, no one else in the queue reacts, so why should he? Chances are, you wouldn't have done anything either. Whatever the man in the blue shirt thinks he's seen, he's influenced by the apathy of everyone else in the queue. In more serious situations, this could have disturbing consequences. Liverpool Street Station in London. A drunk lies on the pavement. In fact, he's our actor, Peter, but these passers-by aren't to know that. And since he looks the worse for wear, not critically ill, they ignore him. Helping would be inconvenient or even risky. He lies there for 20 minutes and no one raises an eyebrow. This time, we've dressed Peter as a respectable city gent. How long before he's rescued now that he looks the part? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right, then. Six seconds. She even calls him sir. And suddenly, everyone's a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why are you lying on the floor in the rain? After a couple of minutes, even the police turn up. I would just hate to be in this position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was OK. I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin his suit anyway. <laughs> Our actress Ruth takes Peter's place. She's not a drunk, but she's also not a city gent. How long before she gets help? Four minutes have passed, and 34 people have passed. People don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. But it's more complicated than that. If the street were deserted, a passerby would probably go to the rescue. But these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule. Don't help. This woman, for instance, has clearly spotted Ruth. But she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You are you sure? She suddenly finds herself in a different group with a new rule to help. She don't look well, does she? Uh, you all right, yeah. What's your arm? First I thought she was dead. Then I saw check to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke that sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. <sighs> Peter's now having the same problem. This time we've swapped his suit for casual clothes. He's not drunk and we've asked him to act like he's in pain. 
Help! Help! Uh, help me! Please, somebody! Help me! Help me, somebody! Please help me! Help me! Help me! Help me! Please, somebody help me! Please, somebody help me! I got onto the tube and sat opposite a guy who threatened me. Um, he'd been quite... he'd obviously been sleeping rough and had problems, but he was quite verbally abusive. Yeah, I was with a group of mates uh, one day. Uh, we've seen two fellas arguing. Uh, we've literally turned the corner, discussed a few things, came back, and that was it, they were fighting. I'd got up to walk away from him, he'd followed me, and he sat beside me for six or seven stops, actually threatened to stab me. We've had a little discussion between each other, if we should stop it or not. We decided not to, so we, we was on our way. And I was looking at the other passengers and looking at the guard on the, uh, on the carriage, hoping that somebody would help me. We should have really done something, because at the end of the day, how do we like it if it was us? Nobody did anything on the tube. People just ignored me completely. When the guy eventually got off, you know, then people came up and asked if I was OK, but during the journey they'd done nothing. And that's when the guilt tripped in. We really did realise that it was wrong what we did. You know, how do you do it? How do you feel when someone's beating ten times out of someone? I mean, it could have been me, you, anyone, but deep down we bottled it. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule that we ought to help and the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help. And it's very difficult to rebel.